if we have to dial down the truth of who we are in order to fit in, then we not only are a stranger to others, but we're also we make ourselves a stranger to ourselves. Hey everybody, welcome to Live Your Legacy. The goal of our podcast is to help you live your own legacy by connecting you to people and concepts that have made a tremendous impact on the lives of others. My name is Darius and today's legacy guest is our international speaker, best-selling author and global authority on brave leadership. As she is extremely passionate about emboldening people to live and lead more bravely, she is also the founding CEO of Global Courage and worked with organizations such as NASA, Google, and the United Nations Foundation. Additionally, she is also a member of the Forbes Business School Advisory Board and a guest lecturer at Columbia University and SMU. She is definitely not short of adversities as she went with a gun straight to her head during a robbery, losing her brother to schizophrenia and having a miscarriage and ultimately, of course, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro with her four kids. She has five best-selling books, including her latest, You've Got This, The Life-Changing Power of Trusting Yourself, which teaches people to thrive <laughs> amid uncertainty and lead bigger, braver lives. If you're living a life with doubt or fear, let me introduce the woman that will get you out of there and to your dreams, Maji Raro. Welcome to the show, Maji. Oh, hey, thanks for having me, Darius. Right, I just want to ask you straight off from the bat, what does it mean to you to live bravely? Because all of us got different definitions of that. Yeah, look at the core of living bravely, and I use the term bravery and, and courage quite synonymously, is our willingness to take action in the midst of our fears and our doubts and the real risks that we might fall short in doing, succeeding at whatever it is we want to do. Okay, and then tell me the story behind how you got to this concept of living bravely. I think it might be a long story, but just walk us through that. Yeah, look, and I, it is a long story, but when I, when I look back on my life, I grew up on a, a small dairy farm in rural Victoria, Australia, one of seven kids. And growing up on the farm, I mean, it was a pretty simple childhood, but uh, when I was 18, I, I left and went off, went to university in, in Melbourne and then traveled around the world for a few years. But at every point along the way, there was always the lure of sticking with the safety of the known, sticking with what was familiar. And I was always really drawn to exploring and experiencing more of what life had to offer. And what I've found over the years in myself, and I've encountered it in other people, is that the biggest thing that holds us back from living really rewarding lives, we've all got different personalities, not everyone wants to travel around the world, but the biggest thing that holds us back is our fear our fear of failure, our fear of not being good enough, our fear that um, we'll be exposed as inadequate in some way. And it's why I think that the number one, the number one hurdle we have to get past in, in order for us to live more meaningful lives, have better relationships, better careers, bigger businesses, all of that is, is our own fear. It's not external barriers. It's actually the ones in our own heads. Okay, and what inspired you to write this new book of You've Got This? Yeah, well, as you, as you, as you mentioned before, I've written um, five books now and, and co-authored two others. And the, the thread that runs through all of my work is around courage in how we lead, in how we communicate, in how we parent, in our relationships. And the latest book is the, really around the construct of self-trust and the, the flip side of that, self-doubt. So... All of us have doubt. I'm sure you've had a little voice in the back of your head sometimes that says, who are you to do that? You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not, you're never going to make it. What will people say? You might, you know, you'll fall short. And, and I believe that our, our, our willingness to trust in ourselves, to trust in our innate potential, in our strength, in our talents, in those aspirations that tug at our heart, sometimes we go, I really want to do something, like we, we have a calling. Um, our willingness to do that is pivotal to our ability to thrive in our lives. And the barrier to that is the doubt, is that little voice that says, who do you think you are to write a book or to get up on stage or to start a business or to 
pursue a particular career path or to ask this girl out or you name it. And, and so we have to rise above that, that voice of doubt, that voice of fear. Um, and it's, and, and that saying, you've got this, I can't tell you how many times Darius in my travels around the world, I've said to other people, Hey, you've got this, you know, go for it. Put your hand up for the promotion, speak up, have the conversation, make that change, go off and do that travel or whatever it is. But in the last few years, and in fact, one of the, the reasons for me even being in Singapore is I had been planning, all of my plans had been around moving from the Australia where I was living back to the US. We'd sent two of my children there to boarding school. Um, it was, that was the big plan. And then my husband, actually, his company said, oh, we want you to move to Singapore. And I love Singapore. And I really, I've enjoyed living here, but it wasn't part of my plan to move here with then children in the United States. So in the midst of all of the challenges of my last few years, I was like, I've had to remind myself, I've got this. I can parent my kids, four kids over two continents. I can figure this out. I can build my career and business in a third continent because I started in the US where we lived and then I went back to Australia and had to start over again here in Singapore in Asia. And so I've had to tell myself a few times, Margie, you've got this, you've got this. <laughs> and, and so as I say in the opening, opening page of the book, you know, there's, if, you ever, if there's ever a book you want to read and it hasn't been written, then you must be the one to write that book. It was something Toni Morrison, an author, said. And I just thought, this is the book I want to read. I want to, I want to read a book that reminds me that I've got everything it takes to deal with the challenges ahead and to pursue my own aspirations. And so you were mentioning about this whole thing about doubt, right? Where we go into that zone of, who, who am I to do this, right? Or we're not enough sometimes. So how, do, how does one start to accept that flaw of like not being enough and get out of that zone of doubt? Yeah, and I think, and I, there's a chapter in, uh, in, in You've Got This, chapter two is doubt your doubts. So we all have a voice in our heads that's a, that, that's, that can be doubting. And the, tr the reality is it doesn't go away. There's no magic formula. I can't say, hey, do this, and then you'll never have a moment's doubt again. And in fact, that would be kind of dangerous. Um, but recognizing that that voice in your head, what it's telling you, it's not the truth. Just because it says you're not smart enough, or you're not beautiful enough, or you're not you're never going to be a successful entrepreneur or whatever. That doesn't mean it's the truth. It's just this voice and it's, and it's, and it's directed. It's coming from a place of fear. And we all have that self-preservation -preser instinct because, oh, if I don't try, then I don't have to fail, right? If I don't put myself out there, then I don't have to risk rejection. And so one of the things is firstly, just identify that voice isn't who you are. It's just a voice. Give it a name. Sometimes say, repeat what it's telling you with a funny voice. It helps you disassociate from it. But ask yourself, how will you feel about yourself and your life one year from now, five years from now, if you follow what that voice wants you to do? If you let that voice sit in the driver's seat and stop you from doing what it is that it's, it's, it's saying not to do, then how will you feel about your life if you never do it? And, and ask yourself, what would be possible for you if you didn't? let that voice call the shots. You know, if you didn't think, okay, I know that I'm, I'm scared that I'm not good enough, but I'm actually not going to let that voice sit in the driver's seat. And I'm going to just put myself out there anyway. And I remember actually when I wrote my very first book, I had four children under the age of seven. And I, 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 was, I had this kind of feeling I really wanted to write a, write a book about being courageous. And I had a very loud voice in my head that said, Margie, who do you think you are? You didn't get a great education. You've never studied writing or literature, you know, all of these reasons why not, why I shouldn't do it. And it was by giving myself permission to write an imperfect book and go, you know what? I don't want to one day on my deathbed, look back and go, what if I tried? And so to anyone listening, often our fear of not doing things well enough or our, we have a benchmark that we're supposed to do something perfectly before we start or we're supposed to know exactly what we're doing. And if I had to wait until I knew exactly what I was doing or I had no doubt how I was brilliant at, at writing, for instance, I would never have written that book. I would never have done, I'd never have got up on a stage and given a talk. 
And so it's about giving ourselves permission to try things even though we're not ready and to do things even though that we know the first time we're not going to do it brilliantly and to just trust in that, that tug on us to, to, to that it's, it's leading us in a direction to trust that we all have what I think is an inner sage, like a, so whether you believe it's the voice of God or it's the voice of just a wise intuitive sense, but we all have these little inklings at time that I just feel like I'm supposed to do this. And, and I believe when we trust in ourselves, trust in that kind of inner knowing and, and use that to guide us, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back and after I was in that armed robbery in Papua New Guinea many years ago, you, you referenced a gun at my head. I, I decided I'm going to go back to university and I went and studied psychology. I had originally studied business and, and it was just a feeling. I didn't even know where it was going to take me. I had no idea what the end point destination was but I had become really interested. I'd also had an eating disorder through my teens and early twenties. And I'd just become very interested in why is it that smart, capable people, I knew I was bright and intelligent, keep doing self-destructive things. And why do we so often act in ways that work against us? And that desire to help other people get out of their own way and to to really look within themselves for the answers that they're looking for outside of the security that they're seeking in external things. I knew that that was a direction I felt called to, called to, to travel in. I really love the part where you talk about the visualization, where you visualize yourself when, when this is your death, death bed and you're thinking, um, is this something I'll regret or is this something I'll enjoy doing? But I, lo- I totally love that technique. Um, so, you talk about doubt already. And then the other one that you constantly mention is fear, right? I think one of our fears is also the fear of judgment and we're often held back by the opinions of others. So how does one live a life of full authenticity? Yeah, and I think we are social creatures, right? We are wired to want to belong. We're wired to want to fit in and be liked. That's just what it is to be human. And that's not bad. In fact, we're at our best when we feel connected. And you and I are doing this in the midst of the circuit breaker. Right now, we're, we're not able to be connected physically to people we like to be connected to physically or we want to hang out with. And so I've been very intentional for myself during this time to be staying emotionally, socially connected, even though I'm physically distanced. And so for all of us, we want to fit in. And we want to be liked. But here's the truth. If we have to dial down the truth of who we are in order to fit in, then we not only are a stranger to others, but we're also going to make ourselves a stranger to ourselves. And I'm sure you've heard that saying, Dr. Zeus, you know, be who you are because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. And so we do have a fear of disapproval or or being criticized. I have that too. I like to be liked. And I know that I don't want to let other people's opinions matter more than my own opinion, but I still am sensitive to do people like me or not like me. And, and I have to just embrace that's part of my own wiring, my own, my own humanity. But what I've also come to be very present to over the years is that if I let my fear of what other people might think. I don't even know what they're going to think, but if my fear of what they might think, decide, determine what I do and what I say and how I express myself, that's actually going to help stop me being authentic because now I'm letting them, what they think matter more than what I think. And so trusting in ourselves and and overcoming our fear is also about being authentic and showing up as who we are and that doesn't mean we don't we don't we we're inconsiderate of other people's thoughts and feelings I, I it's not like i'm just going to say things and i don't care if it hurts other people's feelings it's not that at all it's about being very mindful of that but also not selling out on who we are and lowering those masks we sometimes wear we go like what people wear when they're always putting on a mask for how they are in the world and those social masks that we wear can make us a stranger, not just to others, but a stranger to ourselves. And so there's such a power in authentic self-expression and just being truthful about who we are. We all have good days. We all have bad days. We're not always brave. I'm not always brave, 
Um, but the more truthful we can be with ourselves and others, the more that allows us to forge deeper connections and to, to actually walk that, that, that more truthful, braver path in our, in our lives, in our careers and in our relationships too. Okay, and you mentioned a lot about, you know, being yourself, being authentic, being that bigger, braver uh, life that you want to live. And so what would you say to people who are living like be being themselves, truly being themselves, but they aren't able to connect with people because they are being themselves? And I've gone through this uh, sometimes with people who have this difficulty of, I'm being, my, I'm being myself, however, I'm not really... Uh, able to connect or attract others to me? You know what? There's, a, there's two parts to that. If, if the people you're hanging out with don't bring out the best version of you, then I would say to people, find other people to hang out with. Um, you know, don't, don't dial yourself down. Don't, don't, don't not be who you are because, those, because maybe they're not the right crew for you. Like not everyone's for us. There's some people I meet, they're just not for me. And I know I'm not for them and that's okay. But on, the other, but on the same side of that, I also think we have to be mindful is where is it that actually, if we're, if we're repelling other people, other people are really not wanting to hang out with us, it's not because we're being authentic. It's actually because we're being inauthentic. It's because we are trying so hard to prove something or please, please or impress that actually it's making us someone who is less attractive for others to be around. Because I think of people who are just who they are. Not everyone I meet who's who they are is for me, but I'm always like, I just love that you're yourself. Maybe you're really quirky. Maybe you've got a funny sense of humor. Maybe, you know, you're, you just love that you're a dork and you're really into science or something. And I'm like, I love that you love that. It's not my thing, but I love that you love that. But actually the people that sometimes others repel from, it's because they're acting in ways that are actually coming from fear. And so they're acting in ways that are destructive to relationships that do alienate other people. And so if that is a constant pattern, then I would just get you to, to invite people to do some real self-reflection. But I know myself that the less we try to prove and to be likable, the more likable we generally are. I totally love the fact about self-awareness and knowing who are the people that you want to be around with and who are the people that probably you wouldn't want to be around with. And so talking back to the point of fear, right? And I'm sure in your books, right, I've read through some of them where you address uh, many different kinds of fears, fears of failure, fear of success and many, and many others, right? So what do you think is the biggest fear that's holding back most of us? You actually hit on it earlier. Um, so yes, there's fear of failure and fear of success and fear of loss. There's different, but they've all got a, a lot of commonality. And I think at the core underlying all of it is a deep seated fear of our own inadequacy, our own, that we are not good enough, lovable enough, worthy enough, just as we are. And when we're able to operate from a place of a deep sense of adequacy, it doesn't mean I'm brilliant at everything, doesn't mean I don't make mistakes, but that I am innately worthy, I am innately adequate, then that actually frees us from trying to prove that we are or, or trying to desperately get affirmation from other people or, or avoid the potential that will be exposed as a fraud, that you will realise I'm absolutely inadequate. Um, and I know for me, even in my work, um, my books, all of them, I have started every book, including this most recent one, you've got this, with very present to a sense of, I don't know that I have what it takes to write a book that will move and inspire and embolden people to the extent that I want. I, I don't know that I have that. I may well be inadequate for that task, um, but I'm going to, to write this book anyway, the best I can, and I'm willing to risk falling short because it's, I don't want to look back one day and think, what if I tried? And it's that future self exercise, which I actually have in there. You know, consult with your future self. You, 
20 years from now and say, what does my future self want me to know? And I think ultimately most of us, if when we consult, consult with our future self, one of the core messages, and I've run a lot of programs over the years and including Live Brave Weekends, I'm just here even in, in Singapore last year. What is the number one thing that comes back is, for most people, it's that you are enough or you've got this or yes, believe in yourself or trust yourself or, or, or make that change or go for it. It's something along the lines of, yes, you are absolutely, you have everything you need for whatever it is you think you, you, you feel called to do. And when we can live from that place and operate from that place where we're not constantly hustling to try and prove something, we're not trying to be anything, we're just being ourselves on purpose towards goals and aspirations that are meaningful to us. And what's meaningful to me is different to you. We're all different. We're all wired to do different things because, and we've got different experiences and different skills and hard won wisdom and expertise and talents. But when we're moving toward goals that are meaningful to us and we're coming from a place of I'm grounded in our own certainty that we, we have everything it takes, doesn't mean we know everything, but we have everything it takes, then it really transforms our experience of being alive. Because then no matter what happens, we know I can handle it. I've got this. And it's, it's all in here. It's not out there. So you talk about how there are times where you have, got that feeling of, you know, you're not enough. And then there are days that probably you tell yourself, yeah, I'm enough, right? And even though some people go through that visualization exercise of, you know, oh, I'm, I know that I'm enough, but there are some days where, you know, you just get caught off guard with that whole fear coming back on, yeah. I'm, not en- I'm not good enough. So what do you think are some habits that you yourself use in order to build that whole level of every day where when there are doubts and fears that come in, you still can tell yourself that, you know what, I'm enough. Yeah, and, 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 and really good point that you've raised because the truth is <laughs> I don't get to, none of us get to a point where we go, okay, yeah, I totally got it. I'm enough and I'm good and I, now I'll go and I never have to stop and think it again. Those voices, those fears are going to come up and come up. There's going to be things in our environment that are going to trigger us right now in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. So many of us have lost a lot of certainty. A lot of our plans have fallen apart. People find themselves in financially difficult situations. Businesses that they've built are looking really precarious. You know, so many of us have been profoundly impacted by this. And and certainly my own business, my own income stream just fell off a cliff when everything was cancelled. And so those doubts are going to come up. (gasps) Have I got what it takes? Will I get through this? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the rituals that we have, the practices in our lives. And I've been doubling down, tripling down on those myself. And, and they need to be physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally in all those domains of our lives. So physically, making sure we're taking care of ourselves, exercising our bodies, eating well, getting enough sleep, that stuff really matters. Mentally, I take time, I've got a little list here by, by, my, by my desk, of just making sure every week I'm mapping out what are my top priorities? Where do I add the most value? What are my long-term goals that are less pressingly urgent, but that I'm using my time well? So make sure you're prioritizing your time, mapping out your day and your week well. Emotionally, being connected with other people, practicing gratitude, um, uh, doing doing meditations, those things that help us process our stress and get centered. And spiritually, my spiritual practice is so core to me to like really tap into that, that spiritual element of my life and be grounded in that place of purpose. You know, what is it that's meaningful for me? Am I operating in a way that is allowing me to use this time in a meaningful way, even the difficulties and the hardships? Um, to connect into that, that, that quiet whisper in us that sometimes is urging us along a certain path. Um, so writing in a journal, being out in nature, the Singapore Botanic Gardens, I'm fortunate to live fairly close to them. I go, go, go there every day, just take in the nature. <laughs> um, music, um, those things that can just feed us in a spiritual way. All of those things are really important. And when, the, when we're going through a difficult time, when we're feeling a lot of pressure, they're even more important to prioritize what empowers because that, if you think about bandwidth, that expands our bandwidth for dealing with life. We can, our our recovery mode is faster 
when we're investing in those things that help us bring our best selves to our challenges. And we've all got challenges. We've all got problems. We all have to deal with problem people. Um, but the problems aren't the problem. It's how we respond to the problem. And so when we invest even a little bit of time every day, even a little bit of yoga if I don't get outside because it's raining or a little bit of just reading something that's, that lifts me up, just little tiny things can make a big difference to our days. And so I can't, I have a whole chapter and you've got this on how we can do things that strengthen our wings to soar above those challenges. And I can't encourage people enough to really double down on that. Okay, I really like the thoughts on how, what you actually do, what you're actually doing right now in the crisis in order to keep yourself uh, and telling Absolutely. yourself that, you know, I've got this, I've got this, and I'm going to plan out whatever I'm going to do. Yeah. So going back to the point of living bravely, right? What would you say to people who, I know people who are really, uh, who really dislike risk, right? I'm pretty sure you have gone, through, uh, gone to people and talked to people who, don't really like the concept of, you know, uh, taking, going out of their boundaries because it's risky, right? So what do you really, what, what do you think uh, you have to say to people who dislike risk? Um, and then you'll talk about this whole thing of living bravely. Yes, yes. Well, I will just say this. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the wife of President Roosevelt, once said, most folks tiptoe gently through life only to make it safely to death. So we can live our lives so safely, so risk aversively, so cautiously that we actually miss out on life, on actual life itself. So oh, I don't want to get on a plane at my crash. I don't want to go. I don't want to ask someone out because I might get rejected. I, like we can live our lives very safely, but actually we then miss out on, on life. And so I believe that the things we most yearn for most in life generally lay the other side of our comfort zone. I mean, we've all heard this concept of a comfort zone and we're wired for comfort. We're wired to, for comfort and security and safety, not for risking it. But unless we're willing to risk getting uncomfortable, unless we can make peace with discomfort, then we're never going to be able to build really rewarding, emotionally intimate relationships because they require us to risk our hearts. We're never going to be able to pursue careers that are exciting and fulfilling because that's going to risk falling short and making mistakes and being rejected. So unless you're willing to take a risk, you're actually taking the biggest risk of all. And that is never knowing the true depth and richness that life, we all get one life. We're all going to die. A hundred years from now, most of us, unless there's something miracle, miraculous that comes about, we're going to be dead. It's just the reality that we often don't want to face. And when you get to the end of your life, what do you want to look back on? Do you want to look back on and go, you know, I live so safely, I missed out on life. And so unless we're willing to open our arms wide and go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embrace life as a grand adventure. I'm going to say, what would be possible for me? What if I write a book, even though I'm not sure, it could be a, just a terrible book, but I'm gonna, what if I just took that on because that excites me? Or what if I went back and studied? Or what if I picked up the phone and invited this person out? Or, you know, when we put ourselves out there and putting ourselves out there is taking a risk. What I've found myself personally, and I've seen it happen so many times for other people, is when we dare to do that, we actually discover, you know what, I didn't need to be so afraid. And we build our confidence and we build our courage for bigger things. And so anyone who says, oh, I wish I was more confident, I say, well, if you're going to wait to feel confident, you might be waiting until you're 100. Instead, go and do the very things a confident person would do and you will build your confidence because you'll realize, you know, I can do that. So don't wait for confidence. Don't wait for courage. Go and act as though you've got it because that's how you build it. Okay, so now that you're talking about acting out courage, acting out confidence, right? So can you walk us, walk us through, right? Uh, how does one form a place of fear, place of doubt, to come, emerge out and do acts of courage, courageness and confidence? Like what's the first step for, for these people? Yeah. Well, you know, start small. So if you think about it, courage is like a muscle. And if I go to the gym, I'm not very muscly, but if I, if I haven't worked out forever and I go to the gym and I lift some weights, 
I'm going to be really sore. It's going to be really hard. I'll be able to lift about two kilos. If I go back again and again every day, over time, I will build up strength and things that were once really uncomfortable and hard won't be. So right now, if, some, if, you're, if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, I, I'm really not, I don't have much confidence, I don't have much courage, you know, I'm really shy or I'm scared, I'm really cautious, I'm really timid. Okay, I would just invite you to ask yourself, if there was just one little brave thing you could do today that was a bit uncomfortable, what would it be? And then do it. It might be calling up someone and just saying, hey, just, just reaching out to somebody. Because, but you're like, oh, I'm scared they'll reject me. Might be striking up a conversation. I mean, in an ordinary circumstances with someone at work that you wouldn't usually talk to. Um, it, could, it, could, it could be any one of a zillion things. But, but, but I know that when you do the little things, they build to bigger things and bigger things. And so I have one of my books, Brave, is, is really about training the brave. How do you train the brave? And, I, and in that book, I have 50 ways we can train the brave. How do we train that courage muscle? And if every day you do something that's a bit uncomfortable, then over time, fewer things become uncomfortable. And you go, well, you know, I used to be scared to talk in front of five people at work, but now I'm happy to volunteer to give a presentation in, tr in, fr in front of 25 people. And then when you've done that five times, you'll go, well, actually, I'm happy to talk in front of 100 people. But start with where you are and do not wait. The biggest thing I would say, do not wait. Also, imagine yourself being successful. Just imagine yourself. Practice going through it in your own mind and it will help you also do it then in reality. So that's something I realized after talking to you for these past 30 minutes. I realized a lot of things that you talk about stems for the, from this one term, self-awareness, right? And so just walk me through like how important was self-awareness to you when you started your whole journey? Because I knew you had a miscarriage and then, you know, yeah. um, you have went through a lot of adversities. How did these events become a catalyst to, you know, what you're doing in life? I think a lot has to do with self-awareness. So how important was yeah. self-awareness to you? Yeah, I think absolutely. And then I, I, I came across it in my twenties. I actually, a friend had some books on her shelf and I read some books that I'd just opened my world up. It was like I was living in a little box and I didn't even know I was in a box. Like if you don't know, if like a fish doesn't know it's in water because it's all it knows. Like I was living in a box and I was like, oh my gosh, there's all these other ways to view life. There's all these other perspectives. And, and so self-awareness was like realizing we don't see, I don't see the world as it is. I'm seeing it through my lens. I have, that's shaped by growing up in a big family on a farm in rural Australia, growing up, not knowing anybody who was a professional growing up, you know, with all of these ideas about money and, and, and that were limited, really limited stories. And so self-awareness was, was, was exploded my world. It just expanded it in a whole lot of new possibilities. And so that's where I would encourage people, read books, read books, read lots of books, um, talk to, you know, watch, watch talks. I mean, we've, thank God, goodness today, we have access to podcasts and YouTube and, and things that we never had, you know, when I was in my twenties. So there's so many ways you can build self-awareness um, and go on courses. There's so many wonderful, well, maybe not now in the midst of this, but there's so many wonderful courses that we can go on that help us realize that so many of the problems that we think we have are based on the mental maps that we have in our own heads of what, of what we think, how the world is. And it's actually not true. It's just our mental map. And it's often a faulty map built on false or outdated assumptions. Okay. So, you really talk about um, fear, you talk about doubt, you talk about courage and living bravely especially, right? So what are some values and beliefs that people have, that people, that courageous and brave people have that people who doubt, uh, people who have self-doubt and fear can actually uh, pick up these beliefs in order to transit into a more courageous and braver life? Look, uh, one of them is the biggest limits we have are the limits that we believe in. Uh, people who are really courageous are not willing to buy into beliefs about what they can and can't do based on what other people tell them. They're, they're constantly challenging themselves. 
they also embrace in discomfort as a prerequisite for success. So they're constantly stretching themselves. They don't rest on their laurels and say, oh, well, I have a nice, comfortable job and a nice this. They, they're constantly looking at ways to grow and stretch. It might not always be in the same domains of their life, but they're looking for ways to grow and stretch. But they also have a deep value on, on living um, a purposeful life, a meaningful life. There's a value on that. So not just about what they can get, but what they can give. And so the most successful people I've met are very, you know, in, their, in how they lead, they're often very servant, leadership focused, purpose, purpose driven. Like how do I use my time, my gifts, my talents for a cause that's bigger than my ego and my pride? It's not about me getting a fancier car and living in a fancier house and having a higher, better designer handbags. It's about how can I use what I have in a way that serves and other people. And I think that's a really common trait between, I, I interviewed Richard Branson a few years ago. I've interviewed Bill Marriott of Marriott Hotels, um, Marianne Williamson, the presidential candidate and Steve Forbes and all of those people, they're all different. They have different ideologies, different politics, for instance, but they all very much driven to live lives that are bigger than themselves and to leave a legacy that's bigger than themselves. And none of them would trade in excuses and say, I'm too busy, I'm too old, I'm not rich enough, I'm not smart enough. Richard Branson had dyslexia. You know, he didn't go, oh, I've got dyslexia, I'm not that good. I, I, you know, they really were self-defining. And that's what I would encourage all you to be. Don't let your circumstances define you. Don't let your, your, your history define you. Don't let what... what your hardships define you. Don't let this pandemic define you. Define yourself. Decide who is it that I want to be in the world? Because the only thing that stops you being who you want to be in the world is yourself. No one else. You can choose who you want to be in the world. And the more you show up as that person, the more you train other people around you to relate to you that way. And that is what really, I think, differentiates incredibly successful people. And I'm not talking necessarily financially you know, successful as business people, but just successful in their own right. Yeah, I really love everything that you've said so far. So before I ask my last question, uh, please tell the audience how they can learn more about you, from you, and where they can connect to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, well, best port of call for everything is my website, margiewarrell.com. They can also on Instagram and uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm also on and YouTube, actually, all, all of those social media channels. So I love to connect with people there. And, and of course, my books, you can find links to them on my website. Um, and I also actually, I have a Live Brave podcast. So I also encourage people to tune into my Live Brave podcast as well. Okay, great. So my last question is, what is the legacy that you want to live in this world? That it will really, I feel a braver, that it will be a better world because I will have emboldened people to live and lead more bravely. So it will be a more equitable world. It will be a kinder world, um, a more compassionate world. And that my work in helping, my purpose is helping other people be brave enough to live their purpose and in doing that, that, that we have a, a better world because more people will be really honoring their own gifts and their own calling. Yeah, I really love that. So thank you for having, um, being on this podcast. And for those of you listening, if you really enjoy the Live Your Legacy podcast, do remember to subscribe and leave a like on it and even rate it. So see you guys next time. And till then, start living your legacy. <laughs>